Hi everyone, welcome back. In this lecture we're going to look at the derivative and rates of change in general. Uh, I want to split this video up into four parts. The first part is going to be revisiting the tangent line problem and using now the tools that we developed involving limits to compute tangent lines. Then I want to look at the introducing the idea of a derivative and what that is and, and how to compute them. And then we're going to look at the velocity problem in physics and then we're going to look at more general problems of rates of change in the, in the other sciences. Okay. So in this video we're going to revisit the tangent line problem. We introduced it at least intuitively and then we sort of hit a roadblock. We said that in order to work out the slope of the tangent line we need to know how the slopes of the secant lines behave as the second point approaches the first point. In other words we, we hit this idea of a limit and in order to proceed further, we had to go off in the direction of, okay, now we have to figure out how to, well, describe what a limit is. So we introduced the concept of what a limit is, and then also how to compute limits. Now we can come back and talk about the tangent line problem again. So let's just recall the tangent line problem and where the limits came into it. So here we've got a curve. We're interested in finding the tangent line to a point on the curve. So we're interested in finding this line here. There's our tangent line. And our point would be a f of a. How do we find the slope of the tangent line? Well, this was our idea. We pick a secondary point on the curve. Say x coordinate x, so the point would be x, f of x. Now that we have two points on the curve, I can work out the secant line which passes through those two points. So there's our secant line. What is the slope of the secant line? The slope of the secant line we get by looking at this right triangle. You know, two points on the curve, the slope would be the change in height. That's f of x minus f of a over the change in x-coordinate, or the change in the base here, which is x minus a. So the slope is f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. That's the slope of the secant line. And the observation was that as the second point, so I can talk about the second point in terms of its x-coordinate, as the x-coordinate of the second point gets close to a, that second point is getting closer and closer to the first point, the point we want to find the tangent line at. And the secant line, which passes through those two points, becomes a better and better approximation of the tangent line. So the limiting values, the limiting value of the slope of the secant lines should be the slope of the tangent. And so that's what we've defined here. The slope of the tangent is the limiting value of the slope of the secant lines. Now that we have the tools to evaluate limits, we can now go ahead and start calculating tangent lines to points on curves. I just want to point out one further thing. There are two different notations that are essentially used for, well actually there's more than two, but there's two, two at this stage that we'll be using. Um, and it all depends on how you want to describe your second point. I've described the second point here in terms of uh, x coordinate, an arbitrary x coordinate. But if you notice what's happening, we're really thinking about that second point approaching the first point. So it may be more convenient to describe that second point in terms of how far its x coordinate is away from the original point. So if I introduce this variable h, which, re which represents the distance between a and the x-coordinate of the second point, then I can write the x-coordinate of the second point as a plus h. And then to talk about the first point getting close to the, or sorry, the second point getting closer and closer to the first point is really just to say that I'm thinking of h going to zero. And so that means the original limit that we had describing the tangent line is equivalent to this limit, where we've now just focused our attention on the fact that h is going to zero. Whereas here it was x minus a goes to zero. In other words, the x-coordinate approaches a. Here, 
we've just focused our attention on, well, it's really that h value that's going to zero. Just a change in a variable, that's all. That's all that's going on here. But sometimes it's more convenient to work with one or the other, depending on the example that you're working on or the, or the problem that you're working on. So let's work out a few examples. Find the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f of x equals x cubed at these two points. Now I'm interested in finding it at these two points, so the first thing I'm going to do is let's first find the slope of the tangent line at an arbitrary x value, let's say x equals a. And once I do it for that arbitrary x value, then I can just pop the x values in that I want, a being 1 or a being 2, once I have a description of the slope of the tangent line at an arbitrary x value. So I'm going to use the second representation, the one involving h. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. So this becomes the limit as h goes to 0. Our function is the cubing function, so this is a plus h all cubed minus a cubed all over h. Notice that this is a type 0 over 0 limit. If I pop h equals 0 in, I get 0 on the top, a cubed minus a cubed, and 0 on the bottom. So I need to do some more work to figure out what the value of the limit is. I'm going to try to do some simplification. I see that because h is a factor in the denominator, that that's the reason why the denominator is going to 0 when h goes to 0. The top I can view as a polynomial in h if I expand it out. And it's 0 when I plug h equals 0 in. So h better be a factor of the top as well. And so I do have a hope of expanding the top and getting an h factor to cancel top and bottom. And so that's my goal, is to do some algebra and get some simplification. So I'm going to expand out the top. That becomes an a cubed plus a 3a squared h plus a 3ah squared plus an h cubed minus a cubed all over h. I get these a cubes cancelling off. Now once those have cancelled off, I can divide the h into each of those terms. And that leaves me with a 3a squared plus 3ah plus h squared. As h goes to 0, the second two terms go to 0, and only the first term survives, and so our result is 3a squared. Now I've got a general formula for the slope of the tangent line at an arbitrary x-coordinate, x equals a. I can look at the two in question. When x equals 1, the slope is obtained just by plugging 1 in for a. And when x equals 2, the slope is 3 times 2 squared, or 12. So now we've got our slopes. The next question says find the equation of the tangent line at each of the points above. Okay, so the first point corresponds to x equals 1. I need to figure out what the y-coordinate of that point is. I have the function. I know the x-coordinate, so I can just pop that in and it becomes 1 cubed or 1. So at 1, 1, the slope is 3 as we calculated above. So the line is y minus the y-coordinate of the point is equal to 3 times x minus the x-coordinate of the point. And that means then that y is equal to 3x minus 2. Now at this stage you should do a quick mental check. 1, 1 is supposed to be on this tangent line, so just make sure you didn't make any arithmetic mistakes and pop 1, 1 in. So 3 times 1 is 3, minus 2 is 1, okay, so 1, 1 is a point on that curve. So do these quick mental checks, they're very helpful to do. How about the next one? 2, comma, well what's the, x, or the y coordinate of the point corresponding to x equals 2? That's 2 cubed, so that would be 8. So our line is going to be y minus the y-coordinate of the point is equal to the slope, which we got above, it's 12, times x minus the x-coordinate of the point. So y is equal to 12x 
minus 24 plus the 8, so that's minus 16. Quick check to make sure I didn't make any arithmetic mistakes. 12 times 2, that's 24, minus 16 is 8, and yes, 2, 8 is on that, in, is on that line. So what have we done? Well, just looking at the, the graph here, what we've managed to do is we've got our cubic function. We looked at the point 1 comma 1, so that point there, and we have now found the equation of the tangent line. It had a slope of 3. We also looked at this point here, 2 comma 8, and find, found the equation of its tangent line. And that was a slope of 12. And again, we should do a quick reality check. I do expect the slope at 2 comma 8 to be steeper than the slope of the tangent line at 1 comma 1. And it is. So I got the slope to be 12 at 2 comma 8, and the slope was only 3 at 1 comma 1. So just do, doing these quick reality checks are are, are essential. You want to make sure you don't make any errors and doing these quick reality checks will just sort of give you some confidence that maybe you didn't make any errors. Okay, so let's look at the last example. Find the slope of the tangent line to the curve y equals 1 over root x at the point where x equals a. Here, just so we get a little bit of uh, diversity, we're going to use the other form of the limit for the tangent line. So this is the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. Working out the limit, we need to use the function itself. So that would be 1 over root x minus 1 over root a all over x minus a. And I'm going to do a little bit of simplification putting things in the numerator over a common denominator. So that becomes a root x and a root a. And then we still have that it's being divided by x minus a. Now at this stage, when we're working out limits, is, you know, pop in x equals a, see what happens. The top goes to 0, the bottom goes to 0 when you take x to be a. So this is a type 0 over 0 limit, which is to be expected all these limits that we're going to get. Um, involving slopes of tangent lines are going to be 0 over 0 just by the nature of its, well, if you pop x equals a in, you get f of a minus f of a over a minus a, so 0 over 0. So they're always going to be of this, this type. The key now is to try to figure out what to do. Well, we want to do some simplification to see if we can get rid of the problem, why the top's going to 0, why the bottom's going to 0. Well, it's clear the bottom's going to 0 because of that x minus 8 factor. And the top's going to 0 because of the fact that We've got this root a minus root x, and, and that's clearly 0. Can we get something to cancel in each? Well, one way to do it would be to multiply by the conjugate of the top. The conjugate of the top is root a plus root x, so multiplying both top and bottom by root a plus root x should allow us to now get the x minus a factor to cancel. So that's one way to do it. I encourage you to try that. The other way, which we could do in this example, and I think it's worth worth showing, just because it's an interesting way to think about factorization, is this x minus a I can view as a difference of squares. I can view it as the square root of x squared minus the square root of a squared. So it's a difference of squares. And I could factor it as a root x minus a root a and a root x plus a root a. And then I've got the other two pieces still, a root x and a root a. So I'm looking at the x minus a and factoring it. Now typically you wouldn't do this, but the reason we're doing it here is because I see one of the factors already on top, and so I'm going to use that to get this cancellation. So I see that the factor on top cancels with this one here. They weren't exactly equal. The top was negative the bottom, so that leaves me with a negative 1. And so this then simplifies down to negative 1 over root x plus root a, root x, root a. 
And now I got rid of the issue. When I plugged x equals a in, I got a 0 over 0 type limit. Now that's gone because I, I did the corresponding cancellations of those problematic factors. Now I can just pop x equals a in, and I get negative 1 over root a plus root a. So that's 2 root a times another root a times another root a. So it's 2 times, and it's root a three times multiplied. So it's a to the 3 halves. And so there is the slope of the tangent line to this curve at this arbitrary point x equal, corresponding to x equals a. Find the equation of the tangent line to the point 1 comma 1. Well, what's the slope at 1 comma 1? Well, the slope at 1 comma 1, that is our corresponding a value that we're interested in. So the slope is negative 1 over 2 times 1 to the 3 halves, or negative 1 half. So now we've got our slope, so we can find the equation of the tangent line. It's y minus the y coordinate of the point you know is equal to the slope times x minus the x coordinate of the point you know, which simplifies down to y equals negative 1 half x plus 1 half plus 1, so plus 3 halves. And so there's the equation of the tangent line. And again, always a good idea to do these quick reality checks. The function, which is 1 over the square root of x, it looks something like this. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, 1 over root x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, closer to 0. As x gets close to 0, 1 over root x gets really big, so it looks something like this. The point that we're interested in is 1 comma 1, so it's somewhere around here. We look at the tangent line. There's our tangent line. The slope should be negative, and good. The slope is negative from looking at our picture. It's supposed to pass through the point 1 comma 1. Plugging 1 in for x, we get negative 1 half plus 3 halves, that's 1. Goes to 1, so it does pass through 1 comma 1. So it's got the right sign of slope, it passes through the right point. Quick just sort of basic reality checks to see if potentially you made any errors. All right, so that's it for working out these tangent lines. In the next video, we're going to define essentially the most important thing in this course is this notion of a derivative. And then we're going to uh, work with calculating the derivative in a few examples. And then the next video, we're going to look at a related problem to the tangent line problem. That's the velocity problem from physics. And then we're going to look at a fourth video, which is just rates of change in general, general sciences.